Welcome to More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it, or conversations with the most interesting people you've never met. Today we are recording from St. Paul, Minnesota, Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and Marin, California. Our guest is Montana Lowe in full plaid. Montana, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Montana. I'm the co-founder and CEO of PostgreSQL, um, where we bring machine learning and artificial intelligence into the database. So let's start with, before we get into PostgreSQL, let, let's, let's talk about you a little bit. Um, I think PostgreSQL is fascinating, um, but we have a whole segment for that. Uh, what do you, you know, who are you besides co-founder and what's your background? Um, who am I? Uh, that's a good question. I ask myself that frequently, but, uh, I can tell you more about my background. That's an easier question to answer. Um, you know, I, I've been doing machine learning, software engineering, more generally everything from mobile apps when that was exciting, shrink wrap, uh, you know, desktop software prior to that. Uh, obviously the web has been a big part of my career. Um, but I have found that generally speaking in these systems, the closer you get to the database, the more, the more impact you can have in terms of performance and in terms of capability, uh, in terms of tuning the system, in terms of modifying the system. And so for me, you know, that's, that's a large part of, um, my worldview is very data driven. Uh, I like, I like facts. I like logically connecting the dots with facts. Um, I'm also a bit of a perfectionist. Um, I like, I like, I got in trouble, you know, in school, uh, cause I would not, I would either turn in something very high quality or not feel that it was high quality and not turn it in and at it all. Um, and so <laughs> it, it's taken me a long time to realize that it's better to turn in something I'm not quite happy with, uh, to show people my work earlier rather than later. Um, so, you know, not. There's, there needs to be a small amount of pragmatism in, in how we actually interact with the world. So that I, I would call myself sort of a pragmatic perfectionist nowadays. It's funny you bring that up for a long time. Uh, I had the domain pragmatic zealot. Um, I learned, I've learned, you know, I've been in this industry for shoot over 30 years now, and uh, I have learned through a lot of frustration, stress, sudden wake, sleepless nights, you know, where you bolt up at 3 a.m. kind of thing, that the only result that you find with the pursuit of perfection is failure. That's the end result because there's no such thing. Perfection is so subjective. It's like right and wrong, you know, it's, it's subjective. Um, your LinkedIn profile says that you wired a lumber yard to host your first server. What's the story there? Uh, well, I, I, just to touch on perfection a little bit, and we'll get yeah, into please. lumber yards and wiring. I, I see most work is never complete. Um, okay. And you can always incrementally improve it, and you can always make something better. But at some point, you know, to me, the happy place is when everything is in balance and when all you have left are trade-offs, where making one component better is going to cost you something in another arena. And then you eventually get happy with the trade-offs and you say, you know, I don't want to make any different trade-offs than the trade-offs I've already made in this system. And that's, that's about when, when I would say the, per, sir, when the system is perfectly balanced in those regards. In uh, economics, is that is, in economics, that is called the equilibrium. That's, that's, that's right. Uh, some of my favorite video games are sort of these logistical optimization supply chain oper uh, optimization games uh, where you know it doesn't really help you to increase you know certain aspects anymore because that's just going to create a bottleneck later on in the system so that's that kind of you know i think that's why machine learning appeals to me as well is it, it's all about optimization and getting to a high quality balanced result and a lot of these methods are iterative over time so I think, I think my study of machine learning and computer science has probably molded my brain a, a little bit in, in that vein. Um, so but, what's your favorite, what's your, you know, top two, three favorite video games? Oh, 
I really, I really like Oxygen Not Included, or if you've played Factorio, I think that's another popular one. Um, in Factorio, you're basically just building a factory with conveyor belts um, to build more and more advanced machines. And ox Oxygen Not Included is a fun one. You have these little, it's more like an ant farm where you have people inside of an asteroid and you have to keep everything balanced so that there's enough food and water and oxygen for everybody to stay alive. I, I tend to lean more towards, um, in a similar vein, but it's not the same genre, strategy that's not war. So like a City Skylines or even a Civ Six. I mean, there is combat in Civ Six, but that's not what the game's about, right? Uh, and I'm also a huge fan of um, digital adaptations of board games like Stone Age, Five Tribes, things like that. Well, there's no digital adaptation of five tribes but you get the point yeah um someday we should we should try to play a game of civ together That's absolutely it. I <laughs> i've been fun. i i've been playing civ for so long uh i never played civ one uh but i started with civ two and i remember back way back uh back when i was still launching internet service providers when that was actually a place that you know you could do entrepreneurship and make a living uh, I had buddies over and we were running Windows or uh, Civilization 3 network on Windows 311 work for work groups. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's funny because that, that reminds me a lot of that. Like you just mentioned um, you know, Internet service providers mm -hmm. in, in the good old days, which is when I was wiring a lumberyard. I can tell you a little bit more about that story. Yeah, please. As well. Um, you know, I was a teenage kid um, who thought he knew how to make websites. And this was back when all you needed to make a website was HTML. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think CSS was even a thing yet. Um, so we were, you know, we had our blink tags and our marquee tags and everything was wonderful in the world. Um, one of our, you know, I grew up on a hobby farm with cows and chickens and we, we grew some wheat as well. Um, but, but one of our neighbors was a hog farmer, and uh, hog farming is a big business in Oklahoma, where I grew up. Uh, one of the members of, you know, one of our family friends, he invented something called hog wash, which I don't know if you know anything about hog farming, but they have these large hog lagoons where they wash all of the excrement and offal. Um, and sometimes those things can get so toxic that there's no bacteria that can even, even grow in those hog lagoons. Um, and so then you get like really toxic fumes and off gassing coming out of them. So he basically, he, he found a carbon activated charcoal solution where you just dump a bunch of charcoal in these log lagoons, it provides a little area for bacteria to grow and live in, and then they can help decompose a lot of the waste and restore a more balanced ecosystem um, and clean it up quite a bit. Uh, anyway, he was looking for a way to publicize uh, his invention um, I said, hey, Jeff, I can build you a website. Uh, we can get the word out on this awesome thing. Um, he had a friend at the local lumber yard, uh, and there, there were no colos in uh, Yukon, Oklahoma in the 90s. <laughs> uh, the, the local lumber yard was about the, the most respectable center of town where we, we actually knew somebody that would let us set up an old 486 computer, um, connect it to their phone line, so that we could have, you know, an actual web server running. It wasn't in my bedroom. Um, the one in my bedroom was good for like BBSs with the friends. They could you mm -hmm. know, dial up. Um, but first, they'd have to call me on the phone and tell me, "Hey, can you turn on the, the the BBS so that we can we can play Legend of the Red Dragon or whatever it was?" Um, but you know, I, I got this website set up and running in the lumberyard. It was great, except the, the lumberyard had exposed copper wiring from probably you know the turn of the century like 1905 or something um, when when Yukon Oklahoma was first settled and every time it rained the wires would get wet and the, the server would go offline uh, and I have to drive back to the lumber yard and, and reboot the server to bring the website back up uh, and so eventually I got tired of that and I, I went down to the local electrical supply and I told them you know I needed I need well, I didn't really know what I needed. I, I started asking the sales guy, like, you know, explaining my problem, telling him what I needed. Um, and he figured out pretty quickly that I didn't know what I was doing, that I was not a, a licensed electrician, 
Uh, and he, he was really nice. He, he answered a lot of my questions, but eventually said, like, I can't sell you, you know, what you need. Um, you need, you need to find a professional. Um, so I just came back the next day and I found a different salesperson and I told them exactly what I needed and they rang me up. No problem. No questions asked. Um, so I took my wire, uh, back, back to the lumber yard. Um, I crawled through all the rafters. Um, you know, I, I spliced into the AT&T juncture box. It's actually pretty easy. It, it wasn't really that much of a wiring job. It was mostly just stringing some cat five across a, a few rooftops, um, dropping it down in the back. And then, you know, that was, that solved the problem of a stable web server. Not really. I think that was probably my first experience with like web server and production and how to manage production infrastructure. Um, I was woefully unprepared for, for any of that. Um, I had no idea what, what I was doing, what was going on. Um, but I learned a lot and I had a lot of fun doing it. And I guess maybe that's like the first real professional IT job I ever had. So all important question, what operating system was it running? Oh, it was, it was Linux, uh, of course. Um, this, this was not, uh, it, it would have been Apache um, that, that I was using for the web server. There was no MySQL. It was not a full LAMP staff. There was no PHP. There was no web counter on the website. It was very much just a static brochure. Like, I think, I think we had some, you know, uh, postage stamp sized images mm -hmm. on the website that we were very happy about. Uh, Maybe an image map. <laughs> I don't. I don't think I was sophisticated enough to get image maps working at the time. I think that was a, that was a stretch goal for me. Yeah. The <laughs> wow. Uh, when I got into this industry, I actually got into it through technical books. But when I actually started doing the work, um, my thing was I convinced my employer to start selling custom Linux machines over Usenet, you know, 486, DX266, 16 meg of RAM, and a one gig hard drive, 4999.99 a pop. And we were selling two, three a week. Uh, and we started with SLS and then we moved on to Slackware. And that was the distribution we would ship. Um, and the rest is history. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how fast this stuff has moved. I mean, literally just yesterday, I bought a thumb drive, a reversible thumb drive. So whether it had a USB-C tip and on the other side, it had your normal USB broken tip that everyone's been suffering with for 20 years. Um, 128 gig for 19 bucks with 150 megabyte per second transfer rate, even if it was random. I mean, it, it's just amazing how fast this stuff is moving. Um, before we move on, uh, one last uh, who is Montana question. What is something you're passionate about that has nothing to do with work? And your kids is a, is that's a cheap answer because that's an obvious, that's a given. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to go with a, a different cheap answer. Okay. There's, there's the expression that, you know, do something you, lo you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Sure. And so I think that. I love what I do. I love working on machine learning. I love working on databases. Um, it, it really is near obsession for me. Like sure. Video games are fun. They're, they're relaxing. Um, I go for a hike every single day. Um, uh, I've, I've got, I've got a really nice trail up, up the hill, um, where I can get a view of the bay. And, and I mean, if you live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, you better get outside and do it. And I spend that time thinking, um, planning, reflecting, um, but I, you know, I could be doing anything in the world with that hour, but I usually think about work. I think about code. I think about machine learning. I think about data. I think about how things should be organized within the system uh, and, and how to make the system better. And that's, that's what I just enjoy. I love problem solving. I love this analytical mindset. It makes me feel really good. I've learned that I can't just, you know, be off by, by myself, um, you know, on these walks out in the woods, uh, 
keeping all these ideas to myself. I need to share those ideas with other people um, and have an impact on the world around me. That that is actually you know some some of the motivation for what I do is helping other people out and helping people solve their problems. Um, that's that's long term rewarding for me. I do something similar. Uh, I take. I mean, anytime I take a conference call, sales call, a, a call about Postgres conference, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm walking. And my preference is to walk on a trail. Um, but, every, you know, occasionally I'm in a Walmart parking lot or something because I'm nomad. But I'm walking. And I, I mean, I'll just get on the phone. I'm like, just FYI, I'm wherever I am in the world at the moment. And you're going to hear some wind because I'm in the desert or you're going to hear some car noise or whatever. But let's do this. Um, and often I'll do exactly what you said is when you're strategizing the growth or a direction or trying to find the loopholes or even, you know, the potholes, whatever it may be, you take that walk, you take that hike and everything else kind of falls away and things kind of start to come in line so you can make the next right decision. So I, I hundred percent with you on that one. Um, let's talk about Postgres ML. Um, you know, what is it? And what is the problem it solves? Yeah, the, what, what it is, is it's an extension for the Postgres database. Postgres has been around for 35, 40 years, depending on how you count. It's a very mature database. It's used you know, worldwide by hundreds of organizations, from the largest company in the world down to you know, independent hobby projects. Um, so we, we believe that data is really at the heart of machine learning. That's what machines learn from. The best place to put your data is in a database. Um, that kind of makes sense to me. And so if your data is in your database and machine learning heavily depends on your, your data, then your machine learning should probably happen in the database as well. Uh, that's actually a, a controversial statement for a lot of people. Uh, we can get Only into those that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> some more of that later on. Um, but. But I think that's that's where you know we're headed with Postgres ML, and we've we've gotten some really great results in terms of performance, in terms of efficiency, in terms of simplicity, um, in terms of manageability of this system. Uh, because you know, I, I learned earlier in my career, like we talked about earlier, having to spend your nights and weekends driving out to reboot servers sucks, and it having sys <laughs> having systems that that are low maintenance. Um, that you understand how they work, um, that they're well tested, um, that they're mature pieces of technology. That's really important to me, so that I have time for you know the interesting problems, not the not the grindy chores that have to be done. Um, so PostgreSQL, you know, there are fifty some odd well established machine learning algorithms that are you know implemented uh, standard libraries almost at this point. We take those standard libraries um, and we expose them through SQL function calls. We, we extend the SQL language. We add a few new functions. And really, when I say a few, I mean three. Um, there's a training function, there's a deployment fun function, and then there's a prediction function. Uh, similarly, and so that covers pretty much all of classical machine learning use cases, everything from simple linear regression models up to you know more sophisticated uh, gradient boosted tree based algorithms for the last year or so the hot topic has been these you know foundation models these frontier models these llms coming out of uh, open ai out of meta out of google and so we've also added support for hugging base uh, open source llms to postgres ml We've added a couple other functions that allow you to download these open source models, to load them up inside your database, and to actually run with GPU acceleration inside the database, these, these large transformer models, to do all of the really cool tasks that, that everybody wants to do now. And I think, I think this is, you know, we, we can talk more about what's really exciting about the GPT revolution. Uh, I think I think people will call it a revolution when we look back in ten years. I think it is a, a watershed moment, uh, and and there's there's lots of there's lots of hype around it, but there's also uh, some really interesting things happening too. 
Well, and we, we'll definitely get to that. There's a, a few different uh, action, not action. I hate that word. Action items. No uh, questions here. I'd like to get to first. Uh, you you were at Instacart when Postgres ML kind of you know started fogging your glasses. Why? Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, I joined Instacart um, pretty early uh, in the engineering team. Uh, one of the first things I helped do was, you know, we Instacart started on a single monolithic Postgres database, mm -hmm. like so many great companies. Um, it really, you know, I think being pragmatic about your database choice early on allows you to iterate in the product and in the business much more quickly. And that I think that actually is critical to the success of most startups. Um, not over engineering early when you don't understand your business. But anyway, Instacart had become somewhat successful by that point. Their single Postgres database was straining. Um, we took a large, we A, started splitting the one Postgres database into many Postgres mm -hmm. databases, sh sharding it um, by job to be done or by department. Uh, and then at the same time, we started taking all of our search workloads and moving those to Elasticsearch. And that was that was very successful. Uh, that gave us a lot of extra bells and whistles. You know, Elasticsearch is horizontally scalable, uh, and and so that served the company very well for quite some time. I went on to do other projects, working building out the machine learning infrastructure, um, open sourcing some projects there. Um, <laughs> we were we were running uh, TensorFlow 0 0.4 in production, um, well before it was sane to do. Uh, but we, we learned a lot um, about what, what actually, where the bottlenecks in these systems are, how these things break, what we needed to monitor and maintain and iterate on. Um, but, you know, fast forward five years after the introduction of Elasticsearch, we were denormalizing almost everything into our product document. I mean, you know, Elasticsearch is a document store, effectively. We had a, a document that rep represented a product for sale at a retailer. So it's got a price, it's got a name, it's got a description. It also has hundreds of other metadata fields at this point. Some of them are like 10 megabyte documents themselves, which are just chock full of machine learning features. Like what is every keyword that is ever converted to this uh, document? <laughs> like when, when people search for Coke, that converts for Coca-Cola, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when you, you know, there's, there's a fundamental problem with NoSQL databases and denormalization, right? Denormalization, what you do is you, like, you copy that uh, product data into every single offer that we have. So like you, you copy the name Coca-Cola into the offer from Walmart, into the offer from Safeway, into the offer from, like all of these offers have different prices, they're at a different retailer. Um, but you know, Instacart at that, at that scale had, would have 100,000 retailers selling Coca-Cola. So if we wanted to update like the um, some machine learning feature that we knew about Coca-Cola, whether that was an embedding vector or or an availability, we would potentially have to update a hundred thousand documents in Elasticsearch. Instacart also had you know, a very real-time business that has a very real-time business when they're trying to deliver things in one hour. Um, you need all of your data to be very fresh, and so. One of the classic Elasticsearch deployment strategies is called green-blue deployment, where you have your live cluster, it's serving all your traffic, and for 24 hours in the background, you rebuild your next day's Elasticsearch cluster. And then you just switch back and forth every day, and that's how you manage your write load, so that your writes aren't contending with your reads. But Instacart can't rebuild its index in an hour, and that's like our contractual obligation and, and the, the worst case data freshness that we can, you know, push back on the business requirements for. And so we we looked at our Elasticsearch um, right throughput to the cluster, and we realized that like, sure, we could keep adding shards or nodes to that cluster, uh, but each, each as the company grew, like the additional capacity we got for incremental nodes was not even linear scaling, it was logarithmic scaling. And so that means that our expenses were growing exponentially um, with, with our linear growth. Um, which is not sustainable. Uh, it's not sustainable from a 
uh, an economic perspective to have exponential cost growths uh, for linear linear revenue growths. Um, so, so we, we okay. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm just curious because I, I want to pull it back a little bit. You said it's it's good to be pragmatic about your you know certain choices. Why Postgres? I mean, why Postgres for Instacart, and then why Postgres for Postgres ML instead of any number of other platforms? Yeah, and the, the short answer is Postgres has joins. Um, joins joins allow you to maintain a normal form. Uh, we looked at you know the hundred thousand updates that we were doing in Elasticsearch, and we're like, oh, if we could just update one product row in a table. Um, and that's just one update. And Postgres will let us do that. Elasticsearch joins are really slow. Uh, and so, you know, we escalated this all the way up to the CTO of Elastic. And he's like, no, that doesn't work. Joins are slow. And so we're like, okay, we'll get, we'll try this in a database where joins are fast. And that was Postgres. You know, your, your options at that point are either Postgres or MySQL. There's the whole MariaDB MySQL fork that I think has really hurt that community. And so that for us, that really just left Postgres as an option. Um, so we, we stood up a Postgres cluster. We had learned a lot in the meantime about sharding and scaling Postgres so that we could actually get to something like our Elasticsearch cluster scale. Um, being able to do these joins, there was so much of machine learning infrastructure, data infrastructure, is the pipelines gluing one system to, a, to another, moving the data from your data warehouse to your app. To your feature store or from your application databases to you know your archival store um, and moving all of those away from elasticsearch to postgres was a pretty long slog of an endeavor uh, but eventually you know we got it done and we got it done about the time of covid and in the, at the time of covid um instacart you know all all grocery shopping effectively went online especially toilet paper sales and things like that <laughs> because you couldn't find it in the store. But it turned out Instacart's business, you know, it was, it was already a, a multi-billion dollar revenue enterprise, um, but it started doubling on like a weekly or bi-weekly basis at that point. And that kind of growth, you know, we had anticipated like, you know, maybe doubling year over year, not week over week. And so all of our engineering timelines, forecasts, planning, budgets, were completely destroyed. Um, all of our non-scalable systems, and it turns out pretty much everything is non-scalable at that scale. Um, you're doubling that quickly. Um, all of them broke and caught on fire. And you know, we were looking at solutions like maybe we should just put up a wait list on the site and say like, you can come back in two weeks and that's when we'll be able to do a delivery for you. Uh, like, uh, and yeah, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a terrible, it's... terrible thing. Um, but that was, there was a Sunday morning when our Elasticsearch cluster was at capacity and we had already turned off all rights to the cluster. So all of the data was stale, but at least it could, you know, kind of serve some reads. Uh, but eventually that became too much. And, you know, all of our read queries were timing out after 60 seconds. The website was basically down for a couple hours. And the CTO was like, well, we've got this sort of prototype Postgres system over here. What if we just shunted half of the traffic to that thing? And it's okay if that thing's broken. Maybe the other, maybe that'll give us enough headroom on Elasticsearch uh, mm -hmm. to get the site back up and running. Um, so we did it. Uh, we, we sort of in in the emergency mode, we flipped over to Postgres. Um, obviously, it immediately caught on fire. Um, you know, our CPU load on that system went to 100. percent We just realized there were a few few long tail indexes we were missing. We added the mm -hmm. indexes, and like lo and behold, uh, you know, load on the system dropped to like a few fractions of a percent. And it was serving half of the traffic on the website. Um, Elasticsearch also recovered at that point. And the problem was Elasticsearch hadn't been getting any updates for several hours. Postgres was serving fresh data. And so customers would randomly see like differently updated data. And I think at that point is when it became clear that we Postgres was the way forward um, for, for this system in particular. And there was no going back to Elasticsearch. And so we, we, we had pretty much every database. We, we had been incrementally trying to pull load out of Elasticsearch. We had Druid, we had Cassandra, we had Redis and Memcache and everything we could possibly think of to alleviate load on um, 
on Elasticsearch, but part of part of the learned pragmatism is also like just because you can stand up a database and, and put it in front of your your search service or or put it behind your machine learning um, service as a feature store or whatever to alleviate load on your system doesn't mean you can manage that database and that you've actually considered all of the the failure modes and what happens when your Redis cluster you know hits a hundred percent RAM usage. Um, I mean, the short, the short answer is it crashes and right. you, you lose all your data because you forgot to enable persistent mode in Redis. Uh, that's what makes it so fast. Um, and then you have to backfill your, your Redis data from your Postgres primary anyway. Um, so I hope your Postgres database was sized large enough to handle the traffic, so not just the live traffic, but the backfill now on the, on the caching system. So um, what you're saying with this actually very interesting story, because being in the industry as long as I've had, I've, I've run into this over and over and over and over. The CTO, you know, joins are slow. This isn't 1973, okay? Um, I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Uh, properly designed joins aren't slow. Um, is use Postgres. It, it, that's what all this boils down to is use Postgres. Because not only are you talking about, you know, you had mentioned uh, from a community perspective, because you brought out MySQL and, and MariaDB, and we don't need to get into that. But what you have with Postgres is favorable licensing. It's extensible. And especially now, I mean, obviously back then it wasn't quite as prevalent. But now, I mean, everybody's using Postgres. If you shop with Amazon, you're using Postgres, period, the end. And if you're not shopping with Amazon, I'm not sure what cave you're living in, but good for you, right? I mean, it's just, that's just the way it works. Um, you know, if you're using a database, you're likely using Postgres somewhere. Just like if you're using an operating system, you're likely using Linux somewhere. I mean, 95% of the world's phones, except in the United States, are Android, which is just a Linux distribution. Um, but let's let's move on. Um, we know about your decision to build on Postgres. Obviously, you had a good experience with it at Instacart. It kind of bled itself into your idea with Postgres ML. Uh, Postgres ML is intentionally open source. Can you just talk about why and what you think you're getting from that? I mean, that just goes back to doing things with other people. I, I, I think a big part of the reason Postgres is everybody's favorite database is because of the licensing terms. You can do what you want with it, very liberally licensed. And so making Postgres ML not uh, you know, shipped under the same license as Postgres itself seems wrong to me. It's just like a, an aesthetic or an ethical or what, what it would, it just would seem bad <laughs> to not to not give away the extension because so many we're building on top of so many other people what they have built. Now you see that the all these vector databases popping up. Um, there's like 40 of them now on the market or something. Most of them are proprietary. A few of them have an open source offering, um, but they've they've chosen not to build on top of what you know 35, 40 years of industry industry best practices have built. And we're saying a lot of people lose data we're, we're, and we're seeing like weird performance cases. Um, we're seeing tons of missing features. Uh, like how do you even do backups? How do you do observability? How do you do like these very basic things? And we get all that for free because we're built on top of Postgres. Mm -hmm. So for me, and, and not, it's not just Postgres that we get for free. We get all of our machine learning algorithms for free. We get all of our deep learning, uh, we get all of our models for free. Um, all of these open source models that are being produced at, at the cost of millions of dollars from Meta and, and you know other large teams around the world. Um, and so for me, like being a good citizen, being a good member of the community, making things open source is critical. Um, and ultimately, I feel like it's it's strategically beneficial to us to be open source. I think that there are two two types of adopters of technology like this, of database technology. One is there's individual hobbyists, students, uh, people on their weekend time. They don't have budgets. They're not going to pay for these things anyway. So they're going to use something that's free. Um, they're going to learn it. And then they're going to take it into their place of business. And when their place of business asks, like, how are we going to solve this problem? 
that they're going to have experience with some free product. And I think this is why you know, Linux took off. Uh, it, was, it was free and open source and solved so many problems. And people had experience with it. Whereas like, I, I could experiment with Linux and I could experiment with Apache and I could stand those up in a, you know, as a 16 year old kid with no budget. Um, and that was great. I didn't have money to pay for a colo. Um, like there, I was, I was not a customer that Oracle was losing, uh, because, because I was never going to be an Oracle customer, but there, you know, I like databases as a business. Because I think there are a lot of other companies out there, a lot of businesses, a lot of enterprises that want that can use the services of a database. They can use the services of a machine learning extension. They can use all of these things, and they really want to pay for it. They want to pay for that expertise. They want to pay for support. They want to pay for hosting. They want to pay for you know SLAs. And so, even if you give away the software for free, again, there's the management and there's the operationalization of all these components. And companies are very happy to pay for that aspect. So in my mind, there are 101 ways to do machine learning. Um, there are 101 ways to store data in a database. I think that it's, it's strategically beneficial to everybody if you give away the software for free and what you sell is support and posting on top of that. Well, I don't disagree. Um, I mean, I've been in the open source industry for so long. And obviously, command prompt. I mean, we're in North America. We're the oldest Postgres company in existence, uh, and that's what we do, right? We support whatever you need to do on Postgres, and we provide SLAs and twenty four seven support and all that. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, there, there's something popped up here. Uh, I actually haven't heard of this. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on from Postgres ML a little bit because I do. I definitely want to get into a couple of the comments you made about chat GBT, uh, cause I have some strong opinions about this. Um, but first talk to me about Conway's law. Oh, Conway's law is one of my favorites. I see it play out. I, I've seen it play out several times at several different organizations and the law I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically that this, the software system and the software architecture will eventually come to reflect the organizational structure of the team that built it. And this just means that, you know, you've got your CTO at the top and you've got your VPs under that, and you've got your directors and your managers and your teams, you know, in this big tree and your software folder structure, your file structure, your, your module object and functional structures will eventually come to, to resemble that. And it's this notion that the way your team communicates will actually dictate the way the components of your software communicate. And this really bugs me. This, I really don't like this. It's true. It is, it deserves to be called Conway's law. Um, but you know, at Instacart, I pushed really hard for organizational changes for teams to either change or merge or split because I thought that that would cause the software to change, to merge or, or split across certain boundaries. Because when you have two, two pieces of software or two teams that need to interface frequently and need high bandwidth communication, and they are tightly coupled because of the nature of the domain, if they're not actually tightly coupled in the organizational structure, um, then they won't be tightly coupled in the code base. You'll have these really slow, buggy connections between them, both in the real world and in the software world. And it makes your software product suck. It makes developing your software product suck. Because so, you, you get into these like political things and yeah. you get into like, just like, it, it's horrible. Well, let's, I'm going to boil that down because uh, a lot of our listeners are, are like a real straightforward approach. Uh, if your team is screwed, your software is screwed. I mean, it's what it boils down to, right? I mean, if you have a CTO, at least, and don't, I don't expect that a CTO is going to understand the practical implications of all new software. I don't think that's reasonable. That's not their role. But if they can't understand the bigger picture and actually interface on a level that the team respects, integrates with, drives proper communication, removes chips on shoulders, things like that, you end up with, well, you get it, 
ownership of subdomains, right? Like this is my baby. That's your baby. I don't, I know that my baby needs to talk to your baby, but we're not going to do it the nice way. You know, we're going to do it the hard way because my baby needs to be more important than your baby. And you just, you fundamentally start to collapse in on yourself and it, you see it all the time. I mean, whenever you see uh, an acquisition of a startup and all of a sudden the entire management team is gone, a lot of times that's not because uh, that was part of their exit strategy. A lot of times it's because they were terrible people to work with. I mean, they may be a good person individually, but as a team, they were terrible, right? And you need to move that startup forward. So I, I appreciate, uh, I hadn't heard of Conway's Law, so I very much appreciate that description. Uh, I've already copied it. Uh, I'm sending it over to our CEO because we are constantly uh, churning through how to be a better team, constantly. Uh, in fact, I mean, a really silly thing uh, is, you know, if you go to a company, and most companies do this. You go to the about page and show me your team or show me your leadership or whatever it is. And they have the, the best possible picture with the worst possible lawyer smile, you know, on that page that says, hi, I'm JD, I'm the founder, and this is my vision and strategy. Well, we, have, we hired a new team member a couple of months ago and he was procrastinating sending us a picture. And so our CEO, Amanda Nystrom, she bait, she put a, a cartoon pic of a chick, you know, a baby chicken up as his avatar profile. Well, the rest of the team thought that was so funny uh, in, you know, in between solving customer problems, they've spent the last week AI generating each person on the team. So, uh, and Amanda and I, Amanda's the CEO, uh, we decided to let them run with it. You know what? This is clearly a good team building exercise. Let's not be stodgy. And now our about page, if you go about command prompt, you scroll down to the team, it's all AI generated avatar slash totems based on how the team perceives each other member of the team. It's a fantastic team building exercise. I think people need to lighten up a little bit. Um, I don't, don't really agree with that. <laughs> There's there's something there um, that you're, you're touching on, which is there, there was a bottom up movement that came, you know, organically from within the team mm -hmm. uh, that was expressed and that, you know, top down management acknowledged, shifted, accepted, adopted um, and embraced. And I think if you really want to make Conway's law work for you rather than against you in an organization, you should look at your code and how your engineers are trying to organize the domain in code and you should look at how the communication patterns that they're trying to establish and you should consider reflecting those in the real world in your org chart instead of what happens the opposite if you're not actively looking how the engineers are organizing the domain i think the domain should be organized and you push you're pushing an org structure from the top down oftentimes for like whatever you know ancillary reasons rather than listening to what the people who are closest to the domain and how they really see it and, but there, there is a balance there too. I mean, I, I agree with you that, I mean, if you're in the trenches, uh, the leadership needs to listen more. Um, leadership in general, I mean, not always, but in general, it's sometimes that you get uh, kind of lost in, you know, P&Ls and, you know, quarterly projections and, you know, those types of things, which are important, obviously, that's how we feed our people. Um, but on the flip side of that, you don't necessarily want those to dictate the direction from a granular scale. Listen to your people because they're the ones that are literally bleeding for the company trying to do a good job. Uh, and when you don't, uh, well, when you don't, you end up with a lot of mismatch. You end up with a lot of things that don't, that seem to work on the veneer, but they don't underneath. You end up, re-engineering a lot of work uh, instead of, uh, you know, taking the extra week to fix that one or two problems, you bolt on a different, you know, patch that got it to succeed for that moment. And then all of a sudden you're migrating away at your most, you know, your most high demand time from Elasticsearch to Postgres because joins were slow, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I think, uh, no, there's definitely, there's definitely, Obviously, leadership has a place. There's a reason sure. every company has a absolutely. CEO. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you need you need a very broad perspective of not just what's going on inside the company, but what's going on inside the entire market and how that all comes together and how all the little little pieces fit together into a bigger whole. Um, you definitely need that top down vision to guide and direct the efforts of of everybody. Uh, so I don't I don't mean to imply that. That's not warranted at all. No, I just think it's, it's a balance of like finding where the two meet, where the bottoms up meets the top down, and, and you know harmonizing those two together, finding the balance. Almost like way back in the beginning when we started this conversation, equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's talk about machine learning in general. Um, I'd like to be, <laughs> first off, I have a lot of respect for machine learning. Okay, let me be very clear. Uh, but right now I have a lot of hatred for AI. Um, and uh, I mean, it's visceral. I mean, it, it's Tums inducing the amount of stupid and theft. And well, I'll use the terms in the notes here. Get shit done AI versus hype beast AI. Let, I'm going to let you run with that. What is the difference between get shit done AI and hype beast AI? This this is interesting because I think you know the what OpenAI did with GPT four was they came out with a super accessible, super easy to use three step recipe or one step really um, in a lot of cases for how you can get value from AI. Um, you, can, you can ask this thing, okay, and it's still, it's, it's very useful. I use Copilot and I use GPT on a you know, near daily basis um, to do all kinds of things. Lots, it's very helpful in writing for, for one example. Um, so I think even that use case, it's, it's fantastic. But, it's all. It's it's also you know a massive res revenue generator. I think uh, Microsoft's making hundreds of millions of dollars at this point from from these tools and services. So I don't think that that's hype piece. Um, I think that there's real value being created there. There have been in the past though several AI winters when people had overinflated expectations of what some AI breakthrough was going to be. And I think this is where the, the term machine learning comes from. It's just a rebrand of AI after the last AI winter, after AI failed to meet everybody's expectations. You couldn't get any you know, research grants to work on AI anymore because people were like, that's played out. That's not a real thing. It's all hype. Um, and so they started calling it machine learning and then they could get grants. Uh, so it, you know, it's, it, it is a different set of techniques now and it has come to mean something more meaningful than that. That's, that's not quite fair. But machine learning is also something that's been generating vast amounts of value for at least a decade in companies like Google or uh, Facebook. You know, most of the ad ranking software is powered by machine learning. A lot of your search results are powered by machine learning. I'm I'm excited that we're starting to find new ways for you know an entire generation of engineers and researchers to stop working on ad optimization or attention optimization and to start working on some other interesting applications of this technology. So I think I think the these creative um, applications for generative AI I think they're in their infancy now. I think there's a ton of hype around them. I think as people get more and more familiar with the hallucinations, or in the case of like generated artwork, like, hey, maybe this is actually just dumping out an image that it was trained on, and this is copyright infringement, or similar with code generation, like maybe this is just taking some you know, publicly accessible code um, and is dumping it in the project, and it's not properly licensed anymore. So there's going to be lots of interesting outcomes from all of that. But I think that there's real value being created. It, even even if people will eventually get disappointed and realize, like, oh, this this code is buggy or this writing is, you know, it it has such a distinct tone to it. If you're a writer 
and, and you try to use you know gpt4 even unless you give it some very clear creative direction um it it, it just sounds so blah <laughs> once chat gpt came out uh the level of spam i started to receive from salespeople uh exponentially went through the roof and if by chance there's a salesperson smart enough to actually listen to this podcast and learn i doubt it but maybe i uh, understand that smart people like my Tana, montana myself and others we can see that you're too lazy to put the effort in reading the email is obviously not coming from a human and you're in it just don't send it because i immediately report you to the spam bot and i will spend I will spend an enormous amount of time making sure that your domain is blocked from everybody I know. Um, now, if a salesperson, if you read it and the salesperson made a clear effort to understand the value that they would bring and the email gives a clear effort that they are directing the email toward me as a member of their potential market, I'm happy to read it because there's actually there's human effort there. And that's actually what I want to touch on. I'm glad you touched on, you touched on two very important parts. One was copyright infringement. If you're using chat GB, chat GBT is a thief. Period. They're a thief. I, I don't, I mean, there's a reason why every, all kinds of authors and publishers and they're suing them because they're thieves. It's not, it's doesn't even follow fair use doctrine. Now, if I typed in a search and it gave me back what I wanted and said cited from these four sources, okay, but instead they're they're lit without credit, they're literally building on the blocks of society and all of the human effort to just make money. And that seems incorrect to me. We should be moving toward a situation where Technology is not necessarily making our lives easier. It's making it better. Those are two different things. What do you got on that? I tell people I like to play life on hard. I like to play video games on hard, but I like <laughs> to play life on hard. So I totally agree with that. I think a better life uh, in some ways is a harder life. Like doing a startup isn't easy, um, but I choose to do that because to me it's fulfilling. Um, and so I, I'm definitely there with you. I also totally agree with like, you know, open AI is called open AI, but they're not, they're probably the most closed AI uh, firm out there. The, and this notion that they're taking all of this public domain stuff uh, and they're profiting off of it without giving it back. It just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't pass like a basic human sense of, is this right? Is this fair? Is, is this, good for society at large I and mean, if you say your whole your whole mission is to like make, do good with ai for all of humanity and like what you're doing is like clearly taking advantage of of societal work um, of a common good and exploiting it for your personal gain uh, it doesn't seem like you're living up to your mission statement at that point well i certainly don't argue with that i mean obviously it's technology that allows you and I to have this conversation right now. And that's a good thing. Uh, and this will be published uh, for free, which is a good thing. We don't run, we don't even run ads on it, right? That's not what we're, our goal is with these conversations. Um, but if you say something profound and I take it off the transcript, you're going to be credited, right? Because you're the one that said it. I'm not the one that said it. And I have a real problem. I mean, even Google, even though, I mean, I, I, you and I have both been around long enough when the big, the big scare came, when Google came out and all of a sudden you didn't need news anymore, right? Now, let's be fair. Most news isn't news anymore at all. It's, it's please God, click on me so I get an advertising penny. Um, but even Google Sites, right? Google will say, we got this from here. Not only is it fun, it not only is it philosophically or morally wrong, it is highly legally suspect what chat GBT is doing. Because there's no, it's not just public domain stuff. We're not talking about him, chat GBT searching through, you know, 150 year old, you know, John Steinbeck novels or something. We're talking about brand new, the latest stuff that you can just get 
and I, there's no link. I don't have to click to go read the paper, right? I don't. I mean, I can type in. Give me the percentages of I don't know white people that do X. It doesn't matter. And that's a study that has been done by some sociologist at some university, and they've published that. Well, that sociologist who put his heart and soul into that dissertation isn't getting that credit. That's, they, that's a real problem. It, it, it's a real problem, but there's even something more dangerous in not citing your sources, which is we know that GPTs hallucinate. They lie. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and so if there, if you trust this thing that won't tell you where it's getting its information from, like that's, that's a pretty naive take. Um, if you are not an expert in the field, like I consider myself an expert when I'm writing code. And so I, I know when GPT-4 is giving me bunk and I'm like, oh, that doesn't even compile. Like there's, there's clear checks and balances on that, but I know that it, it's frequently wrong. It's frequently uh, comes up with ineffective, inefficient um, suggestions. And then if you actually ask it some you know, less easily checkable or less easily verifiable question, if you're not an expert and you can't tell whether it's hallucinating or lying to you, that's really dangerous because it's not going to cite sources. Uh, you're not going to have links to click to verify and validate its output. So what you're basically saying is we have a hyper library a massive library of bot generating bullshit yeah and we have and we have an election coming up a presidential election coming up and we have a hyper library of bot generating bullshit that i i have a hard time with that in particular because i and in some ways some things that people are afraid of are not new in kind, they're just new in degree. Like we have had armies of people, like tens of thousands of people employed by nation states generating bullshit online for propaganda purposes. Um, there, there are multiple countries that do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, even this scale isn't really going to be new. The only thing that's gonna get, that's gonna change is how expensive it is. is it? And so like, maybe, maybe it won't just be accessible to nation states, maybe it'll be more accept, uh, accessible to corporations or other large organizations that can start waging these massive propaganda wars. Or even, I mean, even lo think about the, the, the local chapter, it doesn't matter what party, but the local chapter of X party who now wants to have control of the county council in some small county so they can turn it into a dry county, can ban books and prevent medical care. Well, now they have something smarter and more educated than them that's not even a person to generate the propaganda for them. And all they have to do is push it out. Yeah, and I, I think it, if I had to play things forward 10 or 20 years to see where this goes, you know, I would look at the rise of the internet. Um, in general, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, like my parents didn't grow up with easy access to information. If they wanted to find something out, they'd have to go to the library and they'd read it in a, you know, whatever world book encyclopedia or something to, to find out what the facts were. The world book has citations and it's pretty trustworthy. Uh, but then you have the internet come along where anybody can say anything. Um, and a generation of people that grew up in a time where they, most things that were written uh, were fact checked, um, and there were laws like you know actually saying that you can't just make shit up or you get sued. Uh, um, those have been weakened severely mm -hmm. in in the current age. Uh, now news is entertainment; it's for comedic purposes only, and only a fool would believe the things that their newscaster is telling them. Um, like so, okay. Um, it's, I don't and, disagree, but, I, but I'm just like. Man, I'm feeling bad about the world right now. <laughs> well, but, you know, you look at the next generation and the next generation learned and adapted. And we don't trust everything that we read online. We don't trust uh, newscasters as much. I think there's an inoculation that happens over time where you're like, there's a lot of bullshit out there. Have you talked to the average 25 year old? <laughs> they believe crazy shit. <laughs> 
They don't. They they don't even want it. They don't. You can tell them that's not true, and here's your source, and they're like, "I'm not going to read that. I need to go on TikTok." <laughs> Maybe, but uh, but I don't know that that's a new problem. Like it, it's the fair. generation, it's always been like the kids are idiots. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, like I, I mean, I can look at back at some of the things I believed when I was 20 years old, and you know, I was a bit crazy. And I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. like when I'm 80 years old, my kids are going to look at me and they're going to be like, "He's out of touch. He believes like things that he he he." Fact checks and find sources, and <laughs> he believes in the truth. How dare we? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, as we start to wrap this up, I, I do want to come off uh, for your, you know, an expert in writing code. Clearly, you have a lot of ML experience. Clearly, I mean, you have a long history in the industry, going back to, I mean, even Instacart. A lot of people would think that Instacart isn't that sophisticated, but I know a little bit about what these infrastructures take, and it's highly sophisticated. Um, when do you think it's actually appropriate for an organization, organization to start investing in, say, AI ML versus just using it as a marketing speak? So I think, again, this is part of what transformer models change, is you don't even need your own data now to actually start generating some value from machine learning AI in these cases. You need a little bit of input text, which you can get from a user, then you can produce some output text. And like, so support agents, but this is all gonna be commoditized and productized. And so, you know, it's not that you're going to have to change anything as your organization to benefit from AI. It's your tools, your marketing tools, your, your customer relations management tools, your support team, all of these workflows are going to be improved by, by your third party vendors who are going to build AI into their software that makes your team more efficient, more sophisticated. Even, even writers um, will benefit, like you still need somebody to craft the story. You still need somebody to edit the story. You still need somebody to like actually play the role of a curator or establish the brand voice if you're into marketing, whatever that is, um, those teams are gonna get more efficient. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that there's a right time to adopt. I think it's just gonna happen for every company in the world. Technology will march on, progress will march on. Now, that said, if you have your own data that you're collecting, if you're a technology company that sells some kind of software, I think these are the companies that are most clearly going to benefit. And this is actually a much broader category than a lot of people think. Like John Deere, for example, people think that's a tractor company. And I'm like, no, actually they're a technology company that has very sophisticated software that runs these tractors. And, and will shut them, them down in the middle of the field and will not it's, allow you to fix them. Exactly, exactly. And so th this, this category is actually very broad. It probably includes most of the Fortune 500 companies in the world. Um, that have software products, at least maybe internally, maybe external facing. Uh, if these software products have data, then you can start doing machine learning on that data. I think that there's, there's, there's something that's changing. It used to be that the first uses of data uh, were for decision makers. Mm -hmm. You would have your application databases, you would move all that application data into a data warehouse, you would run these big analytical queries on it to do like sales forecasting or modeling or whatever, so that your decision makers could look at trends in the industry. Um, and now these decision makers are like, oh, I want all of this machine learning from my data team to impact my product, to actually be used in the application, not just to generate a report that I look at once a quarter. And that's actually an incredibly different technology problem. The scale, the latency, the costs, uh, the techniques, the engineering mindset that you need to have an operationalized, integrated machine learning application is very different from using machine learning in analytics. And so I think that's really the segment that we're targeting with Postgres ML is doing things online for application's sake. Um, and so we're trying to make that a lot easier. If you try to bolt on the online aspect to your analytical data science workflow, it's probably gonna go badly. 
uh, you're going to make a lot of compromises. You're going to have, have a lot of interesting engineering challenges. A lot of engineers are going to pull their hair out trying to make that system work. Uh, there will be, you know, delays uh, and, and overruns in budgets. Um, but in terms of how early, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of when, when do you get data? If you have data, it's, it's time to use that data more effectively and, and get value out of it. Okay. With that, this has been another episode of More Than a Refresh. Our guest was Montana Lowe, of co-founder of Postgres ML. Check them out. It's an extension for Postgres. If you're not running Postgres, you better ask yourself why, because you're already behind. This has been a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it or conversations with the most interesting people you've never met.